welcome to the Runlet and Baldacci Report. We sure hope you enjoyed our part one show on Gianni Russo, a truly interesting man. And tonight, uh, we have somebody just as interesting who knows just as many uh, famous people. I gotta tell you, the introduction I was gonna come up with was actually said by Jack Nicholson. And that introduction goes like this. You've heard about the six degrees of separation of Kevin Bacon. Well, our guest today has just one or two degrees to a huge bunch of superstars uh, in pop culture. Uh, this woman has written two books. She has done, uh, seen it, done it, and been there. Uh, if you name just about anybody you know in pop culture, from Mick Jagger to Hugh Hefner to Steve Tyler to Liv Tyler, uh, this woman uh, is at least one or two degrees separation from these people. Rob, tell us how lucky we are to have our guest today. <laughs> well, we're very lucky. And BB, welcome back to Maine. It's so great oh, to have you, you here. Thank so you great to have much. you here. BB and I were neighbors in Portland, and uh, and just. Uh, what, about 15, 20 years ago? I lived in Summer Place from 2001 to 2008. Yes. So yeah. seven years. Yeah, that's right. And uh, since then, she's moved to New York and uh, now uh, most Nashville. recently Nashville, Tennessee. And yeah. we'd like to talk a little bit about that. But over the, la the last uh, several years, BB has... Uh, published a best-selling book and has come out with a new book, which Times we have here, New York Times bestseller, and her new book, Rebel Soul. Uh, but I'd like to take you back, B.B., yeah. back to when you were just a little girl and uh, sitting in front of the TV watching The Ed Sullivan Show yeah. and watching the Beatles. You and what did that do? You guys watched the Ed Sullivan yeah, Show. Absolutely, and I remember well, it vividly. I mean, they, were you there when the Beatles? Yes. Okay. So. I'm a year older than you, so. Well, yeah, but you were still, if, if I was 10, you were 11. That's right. Yeah. Um, I think seeing first the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show and yeah. then seeing the Rolling Stones, that was really what sealed my fate. Right. My DNA was altered at that moment. Right. Um, I resonated, I connected with the spirit that the Rolling Stones were emanating. And I, I, I connected with the whole British invasion. Yeah. And I became, I don't want to use the word obsessed, I became saturated yeah. with reading all the magazines, 16, Tiger Beat, because they were covering the British invasion. Right. So you got to read about bands like the Stones and the Beatles and uh, the Dave Clark Five. Hermits, Hermits. <laughs> Gary, Hermits, Hermits, Gary and the Pacemakers. Yeah, yes. And, and um, you know, I loved Paul Revere and the Raiders. Yeah. I, it was just, but they weren't, they were American. Right. But I, I just, the whole pop culture movement that was coming out of the UK, out, right. of, out of England, is what really I resonated. The women, Marianne Faithful and Two Jane Asher and Patty Boyd yeah. and Mary Quant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it just, I somehow knew that that was my tribe. Right. So when I was 10, I told my mother that those were my friends and that I was going to hang out with them and that I already knew them. And you did. I basically. <laughs> yeah. But I basically meant what I said. I, yeah. I, I felt like, oh my God, I found my tribe, my people. And what was it about them? Uh, I don't know. Just something I don't know what cosmic? connects souls. Yeah. Our souls are connected. It's very mysterious. I right. mean, you can believe in past lifetimes. You can, you, you know, you know I, I have very metaphysical beliefs, as you know. Yeah, I do. Um, so I just think that my destiny was something that I, I knew about very young. Yeah. I mean, I was in Catholic boarding school for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and that was when things really exploded, like the monkeys on yes. TV, and I, my mother got me a tambourine so I could play tambourine in the rock mass. I was Catholic, I went to Catholic boarding school, so we had this thing called a rock mass. Rock mass. We would have our mass, and. There would be two girls that played guitar, and yeah. then I, I was the one that did all the singing. I was the only contra alto in my entire school. Really? And everybody else was either an alto or a soprano, but I was a, what's called a contra alto, which is very rare for a child. Mm -hmm. So I got all the solos, and I was always asked to sing at the 
choir and the, the Christmas show, you know, that kind sure. of stuff. So I was very, very used to being the center of attention, even yeah. in boarding school. Right. And when I was naughty, the nuns would chase me around with a ruler, but I would outrun them and I would always go hide. And, you know, yeah. you know I was a mischievous. A you were a little rebel? Yeah, but I also had their love for some weird reason. Um, kids did some stuff that wasn't so bad and they would get expelled. But yeah. Mother Seraphim, she never expelled me. Yeah. She always gave me that confidence that I was going to do something in my life. Some, she used to always say, I don't know what you're going to do, but it's going to be great. Yeah. And after she would spank me and take me around with the ruler and yeah. wear my butt out good. <laughs> and, um, but she never stopped loving me. And I remember when I left school, when I graduated from Villa Maria when I was eight, yeah. She hugged and kissed me and didn't do that with any of the other children. And wow. I kept in touch with her nice. and I kept right. tracking her down throughout my life. And even yeah. after I did Playboy and she knew. <laughs> so, so she knew you were in Playboy magazine. And she still did. didn't. didn't what and you I called her that? up and I said, what did you think of that mother? Because I called oh, her wow. mother. Her name was Mother Seraphim. And she had moved from Villa Maria to um, Villa Maria in Greenbrier, um, and, and eventually she passed away. But I kept in touch with her. She always took my calls. Yeah, sure. And one of my favorite nuns is now on the Jersey Shore, and I sort of want to make a, a, a journey to, to go see her. Yeah. Sister uh, Dolores, Sister Michael Ann Dolores, and yeah. um, I don't know how to explain my life, but when I told Mother Seraphim that I wanted to play a tambourine yeah. in the rock mass, yeah. and she said, why tambourine? And I said, because Mick Jagger plays tambourine. And right. she said, and, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and baby, I'm jumping in here because what's amazing to me is that you had this dream, and I had a dream of being friends with Bobby Rydell and Brenda Lee, and that dream came true yeah. for me. But I looked at the pictures of your book, there's pictures with you, and of course, one of the people that you spent time with was Mick Jagger, and you, there's a picture of you and Keith Richards. So your dream come true. What year did you actually meet Mick Jagger? I met Mick Jagger on the eve of my 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. I was with Todd. He had been invited Todd to- Rundgren. Todd Rundgren. Yeah, Todd oh. Rundgren was um, invited to come up on stage with Eric Clapton at Madison Square Garden to play guitar on the last song. Mm -hmm. So we showed up, and of course Mick was there, and um, I met Mick that night. That oh, and I turned 21 the next day. Wow! Baptism by fire, you that, know. So, Stevie, what was that like, though, to meet yeah. somebody that you looked? Well, the thing idolized. is, is I've never been starstruck. Okay, I've never. Good. I don't Talk look at people that have good jobs or, yeah. or artistic as being different than me. I always just felt oh, that's my equal, that's my yeah. friend. Sure. Amen. That's my tribe. Yeah. Right. Meeting him, how did it feel? It felt like I I already knew this was gonna happen. I, I it's hard for me to explain. Yeah. But um Mick of course took a shine to me immediately and yeah. then we got invited over to this apartment afterwards where everybody was smoking weed and drinking wine <laughs> and, and and Eric and um his backup singer at the time, I wish I could remember her name. She had long black hair. Yeah, yeah. She went on to become a pretty famous singer too. And they were all, everybody was lolling around. And I remember when I got up to go to the kitchen to get some water, Mick followed me. And that's when Todd put his foot down. Todd sort of came in and said, we're going home now. It's time yeah. to go I, home. He saw the forest and the trees. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's just, that, well, Todd and I were not married. Right. Um, you know, we were very young. He was five years older than me. We were, he, I was 21 and he, well, yeah. the eve of 21. I think I turned 20 room, 21 in that room with Mick Jagger. How funny is that? Wow. And, um, uh, you know, we had a very strange relationship. You in those Todd days, it was Matt. very Bob, Ted, Carol, and Alice. Yeah, Everybody right. <laughs> hung out with each other. Right. Um, yeah. Rock and roll was very incestuous. Uh, right. We didn't want to go outside of our circle. Yeah. There was never any stragglers. Stragglers. And, and that's why, you know, Patty Boyd, first she was with George, and George then she Harris. married right. Eric. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, the, there was only a few of us girls 
uh, things are very different. Things changed in the 80s. These rock stars, they only wanted the creme de la creme. They wanted women that could enhance their... Persona. Their personas, and that could teach them things. Sure. I mean, Marianne taught the Stones about fashion. Marianne Anita Faithful. taught them about danger. Yeah. And she taught taught them how to have poise around the royal family. Well, you were a, you mean, were an inspiration too. Uh, the, with a well, lot the, of these the guys. thing is, is I think I got as far as I got in certain circles yeah. because of my background. Because right. my mother taught me impeccable manners. Yeah. Talk about your mother just briefly. Well, my uh, mother is she's influence. the founder of the Protocol School of Washington, right. and 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 at, even at that point in my life, the Protocol she was, School. What's that? The, it's a, a protocol school. Is it's basically a school for teaching people protocol, etiquette, and, etiquette and protocol, right. etiquette and protocol, manners, yeah. how to conduct yourself, what a fish fork is, what where how to set a table. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I knew all that. Right. And so when, for instance, when Mick took me to dinner in London one night. He picked me up and he said, "We're going to dinner with Princess Margaret." Get out of here! And and so I I but and I said, "Oh, you're bringing me?" And he said, "Well, you're the only one I know that knows how to use a fork." And so, <laughs> what a good and it, it was just yeah. Well, he was kidding, of course. Yeah, Mick right. ha, Mick is a prankster, an imp. Yeah. Oh, is he really? Very yeah. funny sense of humor. Very yeah. funny boy. Yeah. And I'm sure Marianne Faithful knew how to use a fork. Right. But I'm just saying that for this particular date, he yeah. wanted to bring somebody with him that could right. hold their own in a situation like that. Yeah. And um, well to go from watching the Beatles and the Stones on yeah. TV to actually being with these people. But like I told you, you there were was a model no, low first speed. There was no you? lull for me. Yeah, no, you never worked I went a from nine being to ten yeah. to being eighteen right. in Eileen Ford's office. Right being signed to a modeling contract all in 10 minutes. Amazing. Right. Just from a photograph that she saw of me that my mother sent. Yeah. My mother again, her intuition. Sure. I have dyslexia and I was a little ADHD. They didn't know what any of that stuff was right. back then. Right. That's right. They just thought you were nuts. So my mother <laughs> knew I wasn't going to go to college. But yeah. she but she said, "Bibi, you have to have a good job. You know, you have to work. Right. Work ethic is very important in my family." Right. And so she thought modeling would be a good, mm -hmm. but see, to me, I didn't tell her this, but secretly for me, modeling was my gateway to get to New York. Right. So I could meet Andy Warhol, and so I could meet my tribe. Right. I resonated when I would look at my mother's Vogue magazine, if I saw a picture of Andy Warhol, yeah. or a picture of Do Joe D'Alessandro, or yeah. Edie Sedgwick, I wanted to know those people. Sure. Did you go to but, Studio 54? Did you go there? I did go there, yes, but not a lot. Not it, a lot. it wasn't my scene. Was, I'm yeah, not Max a big cocaine City. person, you right, know, and yeah. that was like the big cocaine place. That was a huge, uh, uh, Mac Davis, I had a conversation with Mac Davis, the singer. Uh, he was with Priscilla Presley, and he told me that one of the things that he was happy about was he never got into the cocaine. A lot well, of drinking, but never the cocaine. It, it does. It, it, it's, it's it's all a matter of taste. Yeah. To yeah. me, it was like a, a dog chasing its tail. Yeah. It's fun for a minute. <laughs> yeah. And then you keep trying to do Chase it, the and, tail. and it's never like the first the first right. part. Right. And so it it. it I didn't like the way it made me feel. Right. You know, so I. Oh, um, and made other people strange. And I that's think. another reason why I think I fit in so well with the hierarchy of our industry was because I wasn't some girl out looking for cocaine. Right. Whereas a lot of women in that era, yeah. that's how they used they used the cocaine to get in with mm -hmm. the guys and get backstage and to get in the door. Right. right. I mean, I saw a lot. It was, there was a lot of drugs. It was a drug culture. Yeah. It was a very druggy. So, BB, you were not. We've heard stories about the, the, the groupies, the women that made it their business to, you know, to yeah. ha have relations with the rock stars, like some of them do with the. You were not the groupie. You were, well, you no, were I, equal no. to these people. Sex was never my quest. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I make men work real hard, 
to yeah. get in my pants. I mean, it's just, um, I, I like a little crawling, yeah. and a little begging. <laughs> I've always been like that. And somebody said to me the other day, how many one night stands have you had? And I said, I've never known a man that didn't come back for seconds. <laughs> so I've, I've never had one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I've, I've always had relationships that right. meant something, even right. if they were short lived, sure. Sure. they were not brief. Right. And lots of times, like with David Bowie, we we were friends. We right. didn't date, and I we hung out. We I was his sidekick. We ran yeah. around together. We would yeah. go to the top of the Empire Best State pals. Building, go to see the Rock Cats at the yeah. Uh, yeah. at the Rock Cats. I call them the Rock Cats. I, too much rock and roll. I was thinking yeah. of Brian Setzer. Um, we, we, you know, he wanted to see the Rockettes at Radio City, sure. that kind of stuff. Yeah, he wanted right. to see where Bruce Springsteen lived, so we took a limo to the Jersey Shore. Right. And um, he turned me on to Bruce Springsteen. He did. And I was lucky enough in 1973 to be upstairs at Max's with him and two other people while Bruce did a set at the piano. Wow. wow. He wasn't even standing. You didn't even get to see the standing boss. You, you saw the intimate boss. Right. And, and that's when David turned to me. He goes, what's Asbury Park? <laughs> you know, and I said, we'll go there. I'll show you the yeah. boardwalk. I'll show you Asbury Park. It was, it was one of my, there was a venue there. Yeah. The convention center in Asbury Park and Todd would play there. And Sure. I'd been to a few shows there, and yeah. it was one of my favorite venues. So yeah. I knew Asbury Park. It was a, a seashore town. I related to it because it was a lot like my where I grew up in Virginia Beach. Right. Reminded, yes, Virginia Beach. Yeah, it reminded yeah. me of that. So he wanted to see Asbury Park, wow. and I remember he goes, "That's it," you know, because Asbury wasn't as built up as it is yeah, now. Right. So I took him for that drive where he could see all the mansions in Deal. Yeah. Do you know Deal, New Jersey, anybody? No. One of the most beautiful places. Yeah. Great houses, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Red Bank. He wanted to oh, see sure, all yeah. of that. Yeah. So uh, that was my relationship with David Bowie. And when we did finally try to take the step to maybe being a little more than friends, we just ended up, we burst out laughing yeah. and we fell on the floor laughing. I mean, it was just too funny because yeah. once you become good friends with certain people that you can't take that step. You know right, what I mean? Right, right. Where sometimes relationships blossom in sure. from friendships to sure. love. Yep. So make a, he goes like this, he goes, ah, screw it. Let's just play with makeup, you know? And so we, <laughs> that's what we did. We sat there and we pay, pl did experiments with makeup and doing crazy things with our eyes. Yeah. and Which we know, because David Bowie was, uh, oh, what, yeah. what, 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 what do they, they call oh. him, a drudge? Well, what people don't Androgynous. realize about Bowie was that he was a genius mime. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And he really was talented at mime. I, I mean, it wasn't like he was just okay. Yeah. 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 Off the charts. He was good. I mean, he could do all that oh, stuff. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was unbelievable. And so, you know, yeah, of course, everybody was getting high, and and, sure. and he would just do little shows for us right there in the hotel room. Did and you was, maintain a, a, a friendly relationship with him through the yeah. course of his the, life? my life. Yeah. And he even That's came so to sad. my daughter's wedding. I he mean, did. it was this, David, um, I, I never lost my, my, my friendship with yeah. him, ever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're also still friends with, with, with Steve Tyler. You, 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 you well, two are Steven, still pretty close. Well, my, my daughter's father, father yes. Yeah. He even moved to Nashville for a couple of years. So right. I had been there about a year and a half, and he shows up in town. <laughs> okay, cowboy. <laughs> well, what you doing in Nashville? A rock and roll <laughs> cowboy. I've got, to, I've got to tell you this story. I was in Nashville about four years ago with Brenda Lee. We went to the Country Music uh, Fest, and the first thing she says to the, to, at the venue, I want to meet Steve Tyler. And they go, okay, we'll go ask him. They go ask him. He come, was Brenda he come there? Up. Yes. He was, he was, yeah. Well, he loves Brenda Lee. Well, that's it. They said, come with us. And she said, Derry, come on. They go, no, no, just Brenda. So she met him. They became pals right off the bat. And then a hundred people deep were waiting to get an autograph and a picture of Steve Tyler. How did that work out for him, that country music thing that he tried to well, do? Well, I mean, the record did not do great. I mean, I, 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 he didn't make a country record. He made a, I, I call it like sort of a pop record with a twinge. Okay. 
I mean, personally, if I had been advising him during this period, yeah. I would have encouraged him to go country outlaw, yeah. to have done what Johnny Cash did. Yeah, I got you. Remember when Johnny Cash did a cover of the Nine Inch Nails song, Hurt? Yes, Did you yes. ever hear Johnny Cash's yes. version of Hurt? Amazing. It blew away the original. Yeah. yeah. I just wish Stephen had locked his, himself in a room with Dave Cobb or Rick Rubin. Yeah or even T-Bone Burnett, who produced right, sure. Robert Plant and Allison. Right. I think if he had gone that direction, we could have gotten a stronger record. I just yeah. felt that the record was fluffier than his heart. Yeah. We needed to know about the pain. We needed yeah. to, that's why the Johnny Cash thing resonated with me. Yes. But he signed to a very commercial label, yeah. did the typical Nashville thing, the round table, 14 writers. I mean, you look at a song written in Nashville and it got 20 writers, you know, I'm yeah. exaggerating, but you know, lots sure. of writers. Sure. And, um, <laughs> but, um, I, 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 I'm not saying I don't like the record. I, I listened to it like yeah. everybody else. But I, I, I just think there's, he's got another record in him. This isn't yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, okay. He's got another solo record in right. him. And this time I hope he digs deep in there and brings out his guts. Stephen, if you hear this, listen now, to Stephen, this is advice for you. <laughs> uh, is he well, still in Nashville, by the way? I, no, he hasn't been in Nashville now for th several years. For, let's see, he was there from, I'd say, 2014 right. till about 17. So he That's was there that, about three yeah. years. Yeah, okay, seven, yeah. And, and back and forth in 18, because right. he brought me up on stage with him to do Train Kept a Rolling in front of 30,000 people. And that's, you can watch that. Where was that? that? Where was in that? Nashville. At Fontenelle. Oh, sure, yes. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. I'm standing on the side of the stage and I see him going like this and I went, uh-oh. And my husband goes, it's on. <laughs> and it was Mother's Day, so I knew he had something up his yeah. sleeve. Yeah. He goes, there's B.B. Buell in the house. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> but I got my strut, I was dressed right. I had on yeah. a rock, rock and roll outfit and I yeah. just, I marched out there. So and I cool. have to be honest, I I've kicked seen his video. butt. He Did ended you? up giving me the microphone. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Well, if you haven't seen B.B. Buell anyway, perform. But anyway, you can watch this on YouTube. It's, that's right. It's only a blip, right. and, and, but you get to see the magic. Yeah. It's on YouTube. Oh, we, sure. We want to play it. I can send it to you, too. Oh, I mean, yes. it, it's just an iPhone video, but you get you get yeah. the gist of what our relationship well, like is. Well, I would like to see that. Go we're, ahead, Rob. We're, yeah. we're best friends. Yeah. We understand each other. We've only known each other for, like, what is it now, uh, 52 years? 52 I, years. So... We knew each other when we were babies, when we were puppies. Yeah. When I first met him, I was I was more famous than he was. Right. And then suddenly he became a very big rock star Huge. very fast. Right. But um, and he be ended up becoming the father of my child to right. top it off, thank God. <laughs> and, and I mean, we made some good DNA swirl. I mean, yeah. we were like a good ice cream. Speaking of DNA <laughs> swirl, he was at your grandson's uh, high school graduation. Yes, he was, and um, very recently. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. we, uh, you know, yeah, that that, that those are beautiful. I mean, yeah. listen, Great if picture, you guys want to pull any pictures from my Instagram for this, you can. And, well, we, we will. And there's one of those pictures from right. that that was on on July uh, June 3rd. June 3rd was the last time I saw him. So you saw him just just a month ago, or so ago, a couple yeah. months, yeah. And. Um, I, you know, I will always love this man. Yeah. He's a handful. He's a wild bronco. Yeah. He is really. And he, he, oh, please. Off the chat. Some, some, you know, ideas. it's funny. Uh, some people just have that energy. Right. You know, he is just a born bronco. Yeah. <laughs> I told him, you're not a man. You're a horse. You yeah. know, <laughs> I, I, I always get, you know, I get upset too when, when he gets a young girlfriend, and I'm like. He's a racehorse. Yeah. Do you know how to walk, water, clean the shoe, yeah. saddle, brush, <laughs> do the mane? I mean, it's like yeah. some of these guys are so complex yeah. that it is like 
raising secretariat or something. Sure. It's sure. it's it takes a lot of skill. He's a thoroughbred, isn't he? Uh, that's yeah, thoroughbred. <laughs> There's a good word. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Italian. <laughs> Italian. The Italian thoroughbred. stallion. That's but right. um, with Stephen, uh, he's got a very big heart, and I think that that's what balances it all. Yeah. And he's nobody's fool. Yeah. He's smart. Nobody's fool. Yeah, that's, he's very that's smart. Well said. Just like Mick. Did you know Mick Jagger was an economics major? No. The London School of That's Economics. Right. Oh, yes. I, I mean, the guy, they wonder, how did the Stones know how to work with their money? How were they so smart to know how to hire these brilliant businessmen? Right. Duh. Still stay I mean, together after Mick, all these years. You know, Mick sure. knew what he was doing. Sure, yeah. To me, Mick Jagger is the greatest living entertainer. Yeah front person. Well, Tom Jones is a close second. <laughs> you like Tom? But, oh, I like Tom, God. too. He's one of the greatest performers I've ever I seen. I agree. I've seen him a few times. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then my other favorite, my other favorite um, is Burt Backrack and Tony Bennett. Oh, oh yeah. my God. So yeah. sad about yeah. Tony passing. Yeah, Tony, well, look, he had a long life. If I, I can make does. it to 96, right. still being and as... And still singing. And still singing. Late. and. Yeah. Making records with Lady Gaga, oh, whom right. I adore, and and have you met her, by the way? Of course, yeah. yeah. Well, I met her when she was Stephanie. <laughs> really? Oh, she was. Really, yeah. she's, she's always been, been a genius. Yes. Yeah. I saw her in a little club, you know, at a piano. Tears were streaming down my face. I mean, she's just one of those. She and Pink, they have right. that ability when they're singing to just bring Who's you. Who some to, of your favorite female yeah. rock? Uh, well, Patti Smith, Debbie Patty Harry. Smith. Joan Jett. Yeah. Joan Jett. I mean, I'm old school, baby. Well, we I, all, love we all are. I love Liza Minnelli. Liza Minnelli. Liza Minnelli. I've seen yeah. her too. Wonderful person. Oh, uh, but a wonderful performer. Yes. I'm, oh, yes. I like a good showman. I yeah. like somebody that is not afraid to really. I got a little angry when everybody started dressing icky and not caring. Yeah. I like my rock stars to dress up. Yeah. And I like them to care about yeah. giving the best to the audience. Yes. Right. That's important to me. Yeah. And when I see an entertainer do that, um, And Mick does every time. Every time he gets oh on stage, God. he gives him 100%. Elton John, I mean, Mick only needs to wear a pair of black jeans, a t-shirt, and a shirt, which always ends up on the ground. Right. But that's all you need. And he is so rock and roll that it yeah. just oozes out of his puzzle, core puzzle. When puzzles. did you decide Shit, I can do this. I can. Well, I, I always can be knew I could that. do it. I know that. I was in front of a mirror with my hairbrush at ten. Yeah. Okay, so as what soon, made you make take the step? As soon as I saw him and the way he worked okay. the mic and the the way he moved, right? And Brian Jones and the harmonica. Right. I mean, people don't realize I'm a harmonica player. You are. And, and yes, I finally once I got to Nashville, my producer encouraged me. You play harmonica. Show people that I you wish you brought one with you. I would have loved to I would have loved I should have. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't think of I that. I love harmonica stuff. It's well, great. Well, you know what? When I play here next, I promise you, I All will right. whip that thing out and blow oh, all the minds. Yeah. But <laughs> I've had lessons. Stephen gave me lessons. Stephen. I didn't get lessons from a teacher. Well, he gave my, you harmonica lessons? I had a producer, John Tiven, that taught me tricks. Right. It really is all in the tongue. You don't even have to know yeah. music to know highs and lows, it's a scale. Sure. And your tongue is pretty much what your finger would be on the piano if you were gonna pick a note. So when you're blowing and honking, or whatever they call it, yeah. the tongue, that's why you, you don't see the action internally as much. Yeah. But I know this is gonna sound kind of funny and metaphoric, but it's, all, it's, a, it's a process of, it's how you blow and how you use your tongue. You know, it's like a, Okay. I've never had anybody explain it to me that no, way. That's unbelievable. It. It's a rhythmatic thing. Sure. Yeah. So how you move your 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 mouth, it takes practice. I mean, it doesn't come overnight. It's not right. like some easy thing. But it's like anything. The more you do it, the more confident you get. But what I find with me in the harmonica, even though I practice every day, I play an hour a day. Wow. I, don't skimp. I get out all my harmonicas. Stephen gave me yeah, to all, all the, the, tell the, audience the long ones. All, all the keys. All the keys. All the keys. And, How and about little tiny ones that you used to see on I have little ones. I have a necklace that's made out of all harmonicas, and I can even play it. 
Okay, that's cool. I can play it. <laughs> that's cool. And uh, I call that my dog harmonica. I play yeah. that one for my dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and they go, oh! <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I learned how to play harmonica, but it was the way he presented the whole thing. And so I started getting in front of the mirror okay. when I was a kid, yeah. and I would use the hairbrush. Yeah. And I would start to try to emanate this and move, and you know, I was, I was, uh, I wanted to be him. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I wanted to be him, not date him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and um, it, it was just. What was your first gig? Yeah. The downtown lounge in Portland, All right, Maine. Well, let's talk really? about Portland now. This, now this is a main Halloween, show. Halloween, 1980. Okay. Halloween 1980. I always used local main musicians. Okay. I took both of my bands to New York and they played world class stages. And um, the B sides, we, by the time we broke up in 85, we were headlining big rooms in New York City. We, the B sides were pretty big. We, yeah. got, we got far. And we the went far. Huh? The gargoyles? And then I formed the gargoyles. Right. The gargoyles. I met. Um, and, so, and I'll never forget, Stephen King came to one of our first shows yeah. because our name was The Gargoyles. Sure. And um, I'll never forget being on stage and looking over and seeing Stephen King. Yeah. I was like, what is <laughs> Another time I was on stage at the Tree Cafe, uh -huh. and I looked to the left, and there was Stephen King. Yeah. And I looked to the right, and there was Bonnie Raitt. What? And she was in town doing a show, and after the show, they came down and to the downtown lounge, which was on Danforth Street, y'all. Right, right. And uh, <coughs> you could walk from the Civic Center. Yeah. <laughs> and she was hanging out, because that was the hot club then, you know. Sure. But my first show was at a dump called the Downtown Lounge, but it was a cool dump. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. And that was when people danced. Right. And so I had, from the first, opening note yeah. the place was bonkers yeah. and my my aunt mossy was there my mama my oh. whole family you know it was and everybody had a ball yeah. so that was my first gig that was 1980 yep and then my second gig was halloween i mean not halloween was my first and then on thanksgiving i did BB's pajama party, and I did another one at the downtown lounge. So those were my first two gigs. Right. And then my producer, one of my producers, Rick Derringer, who played no, with Rick Johnny Derringer. Winter yes, and yes. Edgar Winter, he also, sure. a lot of people don't realize, Rick Derringer produced, did you know he produced the famous song Frankenstein by Edgar Winter? No. Rick no. Derringer was Edgar Winter's producer, not only his sideman, but, um, to make a long story short, my producer called me up and said, I'm getting ready to do a show with the Ritz. It was going to just be a Rick Derringer solo <laughs> show yeah. for his All-American Boy record. Mm -hmm. And he asked me if I wanted to open the show. I had only played two live shows in my life. Wow. So here was my third show on stage at the Ritz in New York City to a sold out house opening for Rick Derringer with every news outlet you could imagine, including the British press. Mm -hmm. And then I got a rave review in a magazine called Sounds out of England. Mm -hmm. And they called it the BB Factory. I'll never forget the review. Mm -hmm. And it, it changed my life. After that, I had agents calling. Everybody wanted to book the B-sides. Everybody yeah. wanted to book the band. So we had no trouble getting gigs. <laughs> but we still considered ourselves a local band, even local, though yeah. I was who I was and had my New York international yeah, sure. connections. I still lived in Portland. Right. I loved Portland. Yeah. I loved my friends. I loved my band. Yeah. You're my, very loyal to Portland, aren't you? Very she really loyal. is. And you said earlier at lunch that you are pretty much the reason why Portland is, is a rock and roll scene. Uh, well, I tell think, us about that. Yeah, talk about that. I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm tooting my horn no, or but anything, but the B-sides, when we came out, there were a couple of really cool bands in town, um, like the Stains and Zero Mentality, but it was a punk movement that, mm -hmm. that was trying to squeeze through Portland. 
And then you later had your traditional artist, you know, like, um, who's Cobertons. the guy that I opened for up at Bowdoin College? Bill Chinook. Oh, sure, yeah, Bill sure. Chinook. You had sure. your Bill Chinooks, right. you know, and you had, you had your, your staples. Sure. Yeah. But the rock scene had not really exploded here yet. Right. We didn't have a real rock and roll scene. Yeah. And so when I came to town, I thought, you know what? We're as cool as Seattle. We're as cool as this. Why can't we have Amen. a cool rock scene? Yeah. So that was the mission of the B-Sides, to help and inspire other people to start bands. Yeah. And then before you knew it, we had more bands than you could a, shake a stick at. And then you had the Moguls, the Brood. Remember the Brood, the all-girl band? They were great. Yeah. These bands were incredible. Yeah. And so Geno's became like the CBGB's of Portland. Sure, you remember you know, Geno's, Derry? Yes. CBGB's was where Hilly Crystal gave all the new bands a platform to get good. Sure. Well, that's what Geno did here. Geno's was on Brown Street. It's now on Congress. Um, Geno's long gone, and his son took it over after he passed, but now Jeans out of the business too, and somebody else is running it, but it's still a very good place. Good place to cut your teeth, learn your craft. Sure. So, I mean, we used to play there all the time, and whenever an out of town band would come, we'd take them to Geno's. When the rock stars would finish their set over at the Civic Center, they would come over to Geno's. Really? Yeah. Sometimes jump up on stage. I mean, I saw everybody in Geno's from Jimmy Page to Sting. Right. I mean, everybody's been in Geno's. Sting was in Geno's? Of course. I mean, I, I mean, probably more than once. I mean, I don't know. But the thing about Geno's is that they felt like they could go in there. There was nobody trying to take pictures. We didn't have iPhones then. Yeah. Portland has never had paparazzi. Yeah. And Mainers are just too cool to react. Yeah. Mm. Well said. They, they just want it. They're just too cool. Oh, Sting's here. All right. Great. Yeah. Uh, some crowbar. <laughs> uh, 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 all these rock and roll things in your performances, were these before or after you posed for Playboy. Oh, well, Playboy was just one of the Early billions on. of things I've I know, done. But, but it was just a moment in my life. People don't understand, I never became part of the Playboy right. empire. I never hung out with Pef or the man. I did stay at the mansion a couple times. You did stay there? Oh, right. yeah, twice. I, I, I stayed and, there and, once and for knew, two weeks. You, you knew Hugh Hefner. But, I did, but, but, and I never saw any of the horror. You know, there's a lot of stories going right, around. Right. And I'm I'm gonna show my empathy for the women right now Go because ahead. just because that did not happen to me does not mean it did not happen to them. Sometimes exactly. predators are selective. Yes. I don't think that Hef would have been stupid enough to come after me because I had a famous boyfriend and I was a pop culture icon. So I don't think he would have pulled that malarkey right. on me. Right. Well, right. I, and, I, and what year would that have been, if I can ask you? Uh, um, that was early 80s. Okay. When right. I stayed at the mansion. Yeah. Um, there was a period when I was dating Jack Nicholson that I thought about maybe moving to LA and right. bringing Liv to LA. I thought it would be a good place for her. So the comment that Jack Nicholson made that I came up by myself, you, you, would, you were dating him. Well, when he Jack's, said, you, uh, he's, he's the one that dubbed me the mother of rock and roll. Right. He did? Because yes. he thought I was too motherly all the time. I'm always trying to get people to drink water and to yes. eat right and to do this and drink to do that. And yep. Don't take those drugs. Put those drugs away. Yeah. Just smoke weed. Don't bother with all this other horrible stuff. Right. Just, you know. But, um, and one time Jack was being a little, oh, I thought drinking a little too hard. And yeah. I put my arms around him. I said, sweetie, enough. And he goes, what are you, Beeb, the mother of rock and roll? <laughs> <laughs> That's great, baby. And it's, it's just, it stuck. It went from friend to the stars. <laughs> Everybody tried to call me everything but the G word, yeah. I, which I don't even like to utter because it's no. so sexist. I think yeah. we, the sexism right. is, is one it's, of the it's things. It's huge, isn't it? I, I fight it. You yeah. know, I'm a fighter of sexism. I'm, a, yeah. I'm an ism squasher. I Bibi, call how did you feel when the movie uh, Almost Famous came out? Um, I felt honored to be even a speck of inspiration right. for that film. Because, of Crow. course, it's not. Everybody thinks it's totally me. Right. It's not. Right. I mean, it is Cameron Crowe's story. 
the movie was, the working title of Almost Famous was The Journalist. Okay. Because as you know, the movie's about him right. starting as a 16-year-old journalist. Right. And he was the first journalist I met when he came on the road with Todd yeah. to do the story for Rolling Stone on Todd. <clears throat> and Cameron and I are, are born one day apart. I'm July 14th. He's either the 13th or the 15th. I can't remember, but we're... He, he's maybe a couple years younger than me, but we were the babies. Mm -hmm. We were the youngsters on that tour. So we bonded, you know, when they were off doing shop talk, Cameron and I would go and, you know, sit and talk and, you know, he would be so frustrated because he couldn't nail everybody down for interviews, just like in the movie. But you have to remember, the movie is fiction. Sure. Based on truth and nonfiction. So, the Penny Lane character who sort of stole the movie. Right, I had that for a question, yes. When it really is his story. Yeah. That's why I get frustrated with people because they like, you're Penny Lane. I'm, I'm, no, she's a smorgasbord of a couple of women that Cameron right. knew. Right, and you're one of them. She's a combination yes. of, so Penny Lane is, is Penny Trumbull and me. I mean, so right. it's ba basically, and, and then there's other girls that say, I'm Penny Lane. And, <laughs> and, and this is what I say. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's Cameron's story, right. Cameron's life, Cameron's creative artistic license. Right. And if I'm even one speck of that, it's cool. I'm, I'm honored. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, I love what he said about me in my book. Yeah. What is it? That last line. Well, it says, if... Uh, using the F word, uh, B.B. Buell loves it and remembers twirling around, I walk away happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the point is, is that at the time it hadn't done a great box office. Right. Now it's a classic film. It it's is. the gone with the wind of rock and roll. Right. And um, at the time, though, it hadn't done a great, and, and he was nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. So the question that, ta that, that the magazine said, you know, how do you feel about that? And, he, and for him to say, as long as I liked it, that's all that mattered to him. Right, and that's that, what it says. And by the way, uh, the, 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 the F word is used as an adjective. Yes, uh, yeah. no, not a descriptive adjective. No, right. <laughs> uh, and, Thanks for the clarification, yeah, there. No, I had to, uh, and I, I also, <clears throat> you see the coat that Penny, here, let me show you something Go else. And I, also want, I, I also want to show, the, show this picture, uh, yeah, show me of you on the cover of Portland oh, yeah, Magazine. The cover and it says Portland almost Magazine. famous again, and there you are, okay? But uh, yeah, but um, this is my favorite. When I met, the day I met Cameron, I had on the Penny Lane coat. Oh, oh that's it, right there. Oh, wow. This yeah. was a photo booth yeah. picture that was taken. I was with Cam Cameron when these photographs. When those photos were taken? This oh. was the day I met him. Wow. And he remembered this coat and, and it ended up in the, in the movie. movie. Sure. So, and if you remember, oh, do you want to prop it up again? Yeah, just yeah. so people you, can see it. It's a fantastic uh, book. I mean, movie. Penny Lane's opening line in the movie is somebody said something about groupies or something, and you see that eye go, we are not groupies. Right, you know, right. we are band aids. We inspire the, you know, it, sure. it was like, yeah. He took that essence of me, yeah. whereas other girls embrace the groupie word, love it, yeah. and proudly wear it. I don't judge. Yeah. But well, you definitely, I mean, the whole point of this book and the whole point about having you on the show is that you are a force to be reckoned with. And one of the things that, because yeah. we're running out of time, this has gone by so fast. Uh. One of the things that you say, and this is a very important part of the interview for me, is that the greatest accomplishment you ever had from the rock and roll and knowing all these big people, the greatest accomplishment you ever had is Liv Tyler. And well, she, she, she has wasn't become, Liv Tyler. She, she has was become... Uh, Liv Rundgren. Uh, uh, Initially. Uh, yes, but she is so highly respected and I now understand why she is so well loved and, and so humble. Well, I can't take all the credit. Well, you take a lot of the credit. Because my mother and my cousin, who is like my sister, raised, raised as my her. sister okay. Annie, Correct. 
we did this as a trilogy. We are the, we call ourselves the triangle. Oh, yeah. For Liv you know, Tyler. It's three of us. Right. My mother, if, if it weren't for my mother and for Annie, I couldn't have kept having a career. Right. I couldn't have toured. The fact that I had the, the sense and the forthright to bring my baby up here. Yes. So she could feel the grass under her toes. And she went to school here in Portland. She, did. she went to Breakwater. She went to Wayne Fleet. <laughs> she even did kindergarten yeah. at Reiki. Yes. Yeah. And um, but she's a Portland girl. She was not born here. She was born in New York right. City. If she went to school in those but places. But she was in Portland until she was 12. Yeah. yeah. And then we went, then the record company started courting the gargoyles and Joey Ramone from the J Ramones said, Beeb, you got to move back to New York. Yeah. I can't get you a record deal up there in, in lobster country, he used to call it. <laughs> so I'm like, well, why not? It's only a six hour drive, Joey. Yeah, right. and, and he's like, no, you need to live here again. Yeah. So I packed up my apartment on High Street. And my, family, my family took Liv until okay. I got settled. Yeah. And um, I, I wanted to get settled before I brought her into the chaos. So I wanted to get an apartment and so she could have her own room. And, right. and I went back and forth still, even though Joey asked me not to, I still did anyway. Where's the band stayed in New York? But um, 89, I, you know, I went back and uh, we started to take off really fast. But then her paternity became public. And that sort right. of put a, that sort of put a, Kabash. She, had to, she had to change her name from Rangbrin to Tyler. She didn't have to. I mean, not have to, but she did. It, 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 it was, it was, um, it was just, it felt right for her. Yeah. This was her choice. See, what everybody has to understand is that nobody forced Liv to do anything. She came to me when she was 15 and said, Mom, I don't want to do much modeling. I think it's nice and I'm flattered, but I want to be an actor. <laughs> And she sure is. No, she literally landed a role within six months of saying yeah. those words to me. Right. When she told me she wanted to be an actor, we were in the middle of the Amazon jungle. What? Mm. Literally on one of those boats that if you fell in the water, you would get eaten by piranhas. Mm -hmm. get out of here. And she was shooting a campaign for bongo jeans. Yeah. And it was when we got back to camp and mosquitoes as big as chihuahuas were coming after us <laughs> that she said mom, that she said mom when we get back to new york i really want to be an i want to be an actor she didn't want to be a model she, i want to i want to act did she act on stage did she ever do on no, stage no she didn't she act. Started right off of the movies you know what some people like i said i believe in multiple lifetimes some people are old souls some people just know who they are and some people are just given a God-given gift and you cannot put it in a bottle. You right. can't explain it. Yeah. You get your Meryl Streeps who were trained heavily. She's still one of the greatest ever to ever live. And then you get your rawness, your people like live. As you put a camera on them, and she's beautiful. bam. Yeah. Her first screen test brought me to tears. Really? Mm. Yes, she didn't get the movie. Natalie Portman did. She the, the wait, first. Wait, wait, what movie was that? The did Professional. You? Yes. It was yes. between the two of them. Liv was too tall. There was a scene in the movie where Natalie Portman has to wrap herself around the guy's leg. Yeah. While he runs through, and she was a small girl. Yeah. But it was down to the two of them. Natalie got the part, but then she got a. Her first movie was called Silent Fall. Okay. with uh, Richard Dreyfuss. Yes. And then her second movie was a movie called Empire Records. And right, then she, right, and, and then she made, he no, it was heavy Empire Records. Right. But the movie that changed her life was Stealing Beauty. Absolutely. The Bernardo Bertolucci oh, yeah. yes. classic. Is that your favorite movie by her, by the way? I, you know, I can't put, I, I love Cookie's Fortune, the Robert Altman movie myself, personally. The one where she cut her hair off two inches for the role to be two inches long. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of her strongest roles. She's done so many good roles. I love that thing you do. Tom mm -hmm. Hanks's directorial debut. Yes. And he chose her for that. Yeah. And, um, I, Baby, you know. You managed her, you managed her career. I did. She, I managed her up through all that. Ta really? Yeah, through, through she, all, she, all the well, I had to wear a whole new hat. I had yeah. to go from being. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. In a we rock and roll band. And yeah. being part of the rock and roll royalty circle right. 
to actually, I, I just wanted to be the best mother I could be. Yeah. And I know how dangerous that industry is. And I yes. know the predators are everywhere. You know. Everywhere. Predators. And, and um, the Harvey Weinsteins. And I got myself a desk and a phone and <laughs> a yeah. Rolodex, and I just went to town. Yeah. Yeah. And well, congratulations to you. I know, seriously. So I realized that I could do many things. Yeah. It, there, it, you don't just have jack of all trades, there's Jill of all trades. So, I, BB, what's your next chapter? Where, well, where, I, I where, did, where's I'll your... be honest. I only enjoyed modeling. I mean, modeling. It's all M's musician, model, mother, yeah. manager, um, the M word. But uh, I, I didn't like it. Yeah. It, it, I was only good at it because it was her, because I loved her. Yeah. But if I had to manage some of these yeah. crazy people, yeah. I, I would lose my, my right. mind. Right. So, so it was a, a labor of love. I, I'm yeah. not a momager. I don't want to be Kris Kardashian. Right. I just wanted to <laughs> set her up to be poised to go to the next level. Yeah, you certainly and did that. She did that herself. You know, yeah. I, I, I took her to Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And then right. it was all, I mean, live is Lord live. Yeah. If you don't have the talent, it doesn't matter who your parents are, it doesn't matter if your dad's famous, your mom's famous, your right. dog's famous. Right. If you don't have the talent, she had the talent. She did. And, and, and baby, only because uh, you, you mentioned her at lunch, that, that you also were friends and fairly close to Lisa Marie Presley. Well, no, no, I was not close to Lisa Marie. I had the great privilege of meeting oh, her I see. Okay. and spending so the, conversation time okay, with her, yeah. where I got to know her okay. and got to see who she was. You liked her? I did, beautiful person. Sweetheart. And I remember, it was around the time when she was getting ready to marry Nick Cage. People forget that, oh my God, I forgot not only that did one. she marry Michael Jackson, but yeah, she also right. married Nick Cage. That's right, yeah. Nick Cage. I mean, Lisa Marie, uh, and, and here's what I, uh, bothers me the most, is that nobody let her be the musician that she was. And Rob, you've seen I've her. I've seen you her. Saw her and, yeah, you she liked her. was and great. was unbelievable. She's unbelievable. She was she not really only could she really sing, yeah. She had a great voice, yep. played guitar too, and she could write songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, imagine being the king's daughter, how right. hard oh that must God. have been. Yes, incredible. So I think if she had been allowed to really expand and spread her wings as a musician, that her identity wouldn't have suffered. And I think that we would have, she'd still be with us. Yeah. Because yeah. it meant so much to her to look good and right. she wanted to look pretty for the premiere of the, the and basically it's what killed her yeah the the way Very she was sad. she wasn't caring properly for herself right and that was the pressure of of trying to live up to this legacy bb we only have a few more minutes left and i wanted to at least give you some time to talk about your the next chapter that you see in your life you a best selling well, author musician performer yeah where, what, it, what's, what's your next project? What well, you... I would like to spend, I just turned 70, everybody. You look fantastic. And I mean, yeah. I, considering that I remember turning 30 <laughs> and having a party at the, at the Tree Cafe. <laughs> um, I, I, I just want to keep writing books. Yeah. And I'm writing a book right now about animal reincarnation. Please don't cringe. You're going to love it. <laughs> and, um, animal reincarnation? I believe in it. Yes. I believe in reincarnation, period. But I think that animal souls are as relevant and as important as a human soul. It's just an evolving soul. And um, I've, I've written a book about it because yeah. I have a dog that I am certain has been my dog at least three times in one life. And so I want to continue to write books. And that's Good. why I'm thinking about moving back to Maine. Right because I want to have a desk in front of a window where I yeah, can look out at the ocean, whatever. Or yeah. the trees, or yeah. the, or Casco Bay, wherever I find the house. Right. We'd oh, love to have you come back. Uh, I want to keep writing books. Yeah. I've been offered another book um, besides my animal reincarnation. Somebody wants to do a coffee table photo book of my life. Okay. And I would just write the captions. Yep. But um, so I want to write books. 
I want a mentor. That's very yeah. important to yeah. me. I like mentoring. Yeah. I know the technical word is creative consultant. <laughs> but I, I, I like mentoring. Yeah. I love helping young people not make mistakes. Right. Because it's so easy to make mistakes. Yeah. I mean, kids now, you really have to worry. When we were young and experimenting with drugs, yeah. it was pure, it was, the, the, the dosages were so much smaller. Right. The pot now is like, ah! <laughs> but um, fentanyl. Oh, it's awful. I, I, awful. I wanna take a moment. Go ahead, go Caution. ahead. Caution, fentanyl is what's killing all our babies. Yeah. It only takes one grain of fentanyl to kill five people. So they're cutting drugs with yes. fentanyl. So what we did effortlessly, yeah. the experimentation, the crazy. Right. I mean, when we were kids, Timothy Leary made all the acid. That's right. That's right. And he made the acid that went around to the whole country. Yeah. <laughs> it was personally made by Timothy Leary. Yeah. I didn't know that. LSD. It was the very first batches when late 60s into yeah, early right. 70s. He, he invented orange barrel sunshine. Yes. And it's just so scary because yeah. now if, if a kid takes the wrong pill dies. or snorts the wrong thing, we would learn our lesson, throw up, get sick. Right. Oh, never want to do that again, yeah, Debbie. Right. Oh my God, that was, now you're gonna wake up dead. Right. So kids, you don't need it. It's just stay away from it. it the, drugs are not like they were when I, people are like, oh, I want it to be the 70s. I want to live like it's, it's not, the 70s. It? No, drugs are not, as weak as they were in the 70s. Why is Keith Richards still alive? Because of that. Right. I, I mean, can't believe you say that. Because everybody says, how does it, Keith Richards manage to stay alive? How does he? And bottom you, line? You just, said, you just said it because he- Bottom line though, he's Welsh. You can't kill Welsh people. <laughs> <laughs> oh my like God. Like Tom Jones. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, but see, Keith is also, a brilliant man with common sense. Yeah. So when he finally fell out of the tree that time and really hurt right. himself, he stopped smoking, he stopped doing everything. Yeah. And look, he's gonna be 80. Unbelievable. Yeah. Mick turned he looks 80. 104, but he's 80. <laughs> Mick turned 80 on July 26th. That's right. And Keith turns 80 in December. They're only a couple of months apart Are you from still me. in touch with either of them, like oh, even sure. today? Yeah, I mean, I, I do have, I mean, I'm not saying we call each other on the phone, but because of my daughter, who's friends with all their kids, and I mean, we, we all have children together. So you can get Mick on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Mick, not only, that big. Mick only stayed 45 minutes at his own party <laughs> with Leonardo DiCaprio and people like <laughs> okay. that. So his own birthday party. So no, I thought I'd throw it out no, there, Rob. No, no, at least no. you asked. You're not going to get any. These people don't need to do shows no, anymore. No, of course not. <laughs> They're at the point where we should all feel blessed that we can still see them. I'll see the Stones until they're Amen. not able to do it anymore. Uh, they're still the greatest rock and roll band that ever lived. And he and works out, he works out every day, Mick does. Works unbelievable, out day. and yeah. he's even got a stent. You know, oh, he, I didn't know that. Well, he almost had a heart attack a couple years ago, you oh, don't remember? Oh my God, I remember I don't that. know if it was a heart attack or a blockage. Well, whatever. But, I think it was a blockage. But he survived it. Yeah. But look at Keith now, he's so beautiful. He is such a beautiful human yeah. being and you can learn so much from him. Yeah. I just remember sitting with him in Martha's Vineyard, uh, you know, out in Montauk, not yeah. Martha's Vineyard, uh, Montauk at Andrew Jane. Warhol's compound. Oh, okay. Um, I was invited to come out there with Billy Preston and, 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 and we, we took a little, Mick sent a private plane for us and we had our own little cottages and everything yeah. and it was so beautiful. And I just remember walking on the beach with Keith and there was horseshoe crabs everywhere. Yeah. And he was, he had a gun and he was so like, pew, pew. he was practice, target practicing on the horseshoes. Okay. They were dead. Okay, there was already just their, dead. Just their shell. Yeah, right. Well, thank, thank you. We have that. them in Cumberland too. But, thank you for that. Uh, but um, the, the wisdom and the clarity and the, brilliance and the beauty of this man. Uh, I'm just so glad he's still with us. And yeah. I'm glad that he 
gave up smoking and right. has a beautiful wife and beautiful daughters and right. so his daughters know my daughter so nice. and and Stella McCartney and they're Paul all McCartney, they're, yeah. it's all the, so they're the all babies close. they're all grown up yeah my, I know it my daughter was 46 whoever thought that day would come yes. uh, BB can't thank you enough uh, yeah, yeah, we want to have you back like well, nobody's business. Well, I want business. to come back. Next well, time we'll have you come you back, back like nobody's Maine. business. Yes, okay. I would love it. Thank you, BB. Okay, thank you for the Rumlet and Baldacci Report. Thank you.